uh, talk the, my parents uh, given to the reporter or I read my father's you know books and so I knew I was able to you know live through it but when I was uh, 40 finally my mother told me what's happened to us now, this is uh, you know right after the disaster can you see the pit of uh, the church that was about 800 meter away from ground zero the hypocenter the parsonage was located about 1.1. As I told you that the, we, the house was all completely <coughs> destroyed and we were under the house. My mother was unconscious for a while, but consciousness comes back and went out. And finally that she realized that she was carrying me and I was getting weaker and, be, and weaker because the whole house was crashed. That means everything was top of my mother's body and she was carrying me. So her body was top of little Coco. First, she asked for God for help. She didn't care about her life, but she, wanted, she was so concerned about her baby, it's me. So she decided to ask for help, 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 but no one came to help us. She knew she had to do something. She moved little by little and she was able to get out from the rubble. As I told you that church was located about 800 meters away from Grand Zero. Later, uh, <coughs> since our parsonage was completely destroyed, we made a very simple house next to this building. So we started living there. When I was three, two or three years old, I remember the children came to church one by one. They were about my age. I didn't know why they came. My mother, I asked my mother, and she said, they are the orphans. They lost the parents, relatives, brothers and sisters. Many of them were able to live in the orphanage, but some of them are living in this you know, building. When I was probably three years old, well, there were many uh, junior high, senior high students, the girls, came to church one by one. But at first, I could not see their faces because all the bodies were disfigured. Some girls could not close their eyes because all melted. Some girls, uh, the lips are melted with their chin. As a little girl, I could not see their faces. But I listened to their conversation. One day, some girl found a nice comb. She wanted to comb my hair. She was so nice. As a child, I just wanted to see the, you know, what kind of comb she was used. I turned it. The first thing came up to my mind her hand, which were holding the comb. All the fingers were melted together. But I could not ask them. And I, sh I knew I should not ask the question, what's happened to you? What's happened to your fingers? What's happened to your face? Even as a little girl, I knew that's not the right thing to ask. But as I told you, I listened to their, the girls' conversation very well. And little Coco learned. There was one bomb was dropped in Hiroshima City. That's why they were, whole body were disfigured. So I decided, I thought I was a good person 
a nice person. So someday when I grow up, I am definitely going to find the person who are on the B29 and are gay. And I wanted to give them a revenge. I thought I should do the punch or a bite or a kick. Because I thought that's the best way to do the revenge. But I knew that I don't want to uh, my parents to find out. That's what I was thinking. So I put everything deep inside until I grew up. 1955, 10 years after the disaster, the 25 girls went to the United States for plastic surgery. And so then my father was the one uh, started this project. So he escorted those girls and went to the United States. Next day, my mother received a phone call from the United States, but we didn't have any telephone at that time, but one of the school, uh, Hiroshima Jugakuin, the already 10 years after the disaster, so many of the missionary came back. And the one of the missionary had a telephone. My mother went there, that person said, Mrs. Tani Mother, please come to the United States tomorrow, but do not tell anyone, especially to your husband. She didn't know what to do. So 10 years after the war, the many of the big cities in Japan had American culture center, which were established by the US government. So my mother went there to discuss with the head of the <clears throat> organization. And they knew her already. And they said, Mrs. Kondo, uh, Mrs. Tanimoto, please do not worry. Please go to the United States. I will never forget May 11th, 1955. We were at the Hollywood in big uh, studio the hall and the audience were full in the room. I was standing in the, the corner, one of the corner of the <clears throat> stage. I was able to see the three persons. One is my father's best friend from Emory University, Kendra School of Theology. And one was uh, one lady from uh, that she used to teach English in Japan. I knew those people. I was so happy to see them from distance. But the third person, I never met my you know, life. I asked my mother, who is that guy over there? She said, she didn't tell me right, around, right, right that, you know, that moment. But finally she told me, Coco, the person over there, his name is Captain. Robert Lewis, who was a co-pilot co of the NRIA. I was so shocked because as I told you, since I was a little girl, someday I wanted to give a revenge because I thought as a child, if they never dropped the bomb, this would never happen. The children were able to have parents and you know, so all the girls didn't have to, you know, this figured it from the, you know, the, 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 uh, the heat or radiation. So I was always wanted to revenge. But that day, the one of the men were in the same room, same stage. I knew that's not nice things to go run to him and give him a big punch or bite or kick. Only I could do was just staring at him. You the Baron, I am the good one. Ralph Edward, the interviewer, asked the captain, this was a TV program show called this is your life. Ravera said to Captain Lewis, after you drop the bomb, 
how did you feel? He said, 8.15 in the morning, they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima City. They had to leave right away. Of course, that's the first time in the, you know, the world that the, drop, the bomb was dropped, actually, in the you know, city. The people are living, which people are living. That's the first time. <clears throat> they don't know what's going to happen to that airplane, too. So the NRG have to leave right away, right away. But probably they had another order that they have to come back to Hiroshima to see the result of whatever they dropped. NRA came back to you know, Hiroshima. Captain Bruce said, came back to Hiroshima and I saw the ground. I saw the, you know, the city of Hiroshima from the airplane. City of Hiroshima disappeared it. Then he said, I wrote it on my log. My God, what have you done? As I told you, everybody, since I was a little girl, I really wanted to revenge. But <clears throat> that's what I wanted to do. I grown up. But when I was, you know, 10 years old, the first time I met that guy, but people are looking at us. The audience is looking at us. I knew that's a nice thing to do. So I was staring at his eye when he said, I wrote it on my log. My God, what have you done? I stared at his eye. The tears came down from his eye. I was so shocked. He's not the monster. He's the same human being with me. I felt so bad, but I didn't know anything about him. But at that moment, until that moment, I thought, they're the bad one. I'm the good one. But when I saw his tears, I said, my goodness. I shouldn't hate this person. If I hate, I should hate the war itself, which we human beings cause. I didn't know what to do. And they're still talking on the stage. I could not understand difficult English. So while they're talking, I looked inside of my heart. I thought I was a good person. I thought I was a you know, nice person. But when I saw inside myself, boy, sometime I would not listen to my parents' words, or sometime I did fight with my younger brother. Boy, I have a bad evil in myself. I feel so bad, but I am so grateful that because of him, he taught me very important thing that if I hate, I should not hate this person. I should hate the war itself, which we human beings cause. I don't know why I did it, but uh, probably end of the you know after the you know the show. I walk toward to him, but my face was toward to the audience. And I just wanted to stand next to him. I just wanted to touch his hand. Oh, little Coco, that's the only, only way I could do to say, I'm sorry, I hated you, but no, if I hate, I should hate the war itself, 
which we human beings caused. He felt my little finger touched his hand. He held my hand very tightly. That's the moment I changed. My sophomore year in college, I was in the United States attending school. One day I thought I really would like to meet him again. I just wanted to tell him a thank you. The one word I wanted to tell him. Because of him, I changed my whole view to the world. <clears throat> But I didn't know where he was located. So I asked my father's friends and finally I found out that he was in the hospital. He's very ill mentally. I was a poor foreign student. We didn't have, I didn't have any much money. And the United States is such a big country. I could not go over there to say, to tell him that Coco wanted to say thank you to you. And the college education, I had to, you know, do so many things, so I didn't, I did not go over to him. I was in the States for five years and a half. I came back to Japan. One day I opened the newspaper said he passed away. I, of course, regret, and first thing came up to my mind was in Hiroshima, we have a center, Peace Park, in the Peace, in the Peace Park, we have a <clears throat> cenotaph. Inside the cenotaph has a stone box. Inside the stone box has, a, you know, many notebooks were installed. Each notebook as uh, people's name were on the news uh, on the uh, the notebook. People, yes, people who died on August six and afterward, or radiation sickness, or you know, in many reasons, by the atomic bombs, and all those people's name were installed outside of Senator, as the inscription said, rest in peace, we shall never repeat our mistake. I really would like to tell the captain, Louis too, sir, please, rest in peace. We shall never ever repeat the same mistakes. Whenever Wherever I have a chance to go to Hiroshima, I have to go to Peace Park. I have to read that word. Yes. Rest in peace, everybody. I will never ever repeat same mistakes. So meeting with him was something I would never forget. One thing I would like to tell you, I do hope to read this book. I'm in the book since 1946. I always wanted to meet John Hersey. When he came back uh, 40 years after that this book was published, he wrote Aftermath, chapter five. <clears throat> and so now you'll be able to get the you know very very thick one instead of this you know little thinner. As I told you, I really wanted to meet this Captain Liz. So when I met, forty years after this book book was published, I said to him, Mister Hersey. I am not the boy, I am a girl. This is very important. And right after I said that, 
the people who are planning to read this book, the, the old version and new version is a little different. The, when I said that, John Hersey said, Coco, do you have a book? Yes, sir, I do. He wrote it in here. For Coco Tanimoto, who stand out in this book as an error, for which my apologies, page 41, and warm wishes, John Hersey. I have seen this page 41. So he, in front of him, I open it, this page 41. He said, she was carrying, that's my mother, she was carrying their infant son. I am not the son, I am a girl, daughter. So he changed son, he crossed out. I didn't do it, he did it, and changed to daughter. He was a very, you know, uh, thoughtful and very, very uh, warm-hearted person. And <clears throat> I'm so glad he wanted this book. So people start, you know, was able to learn what's happening in Hiroshima. So thank you so much. I don't remember anything on August 6, 1945, but because I was only eight, eight months of baby. But I have to tell you that I learned from Captain Lewis that I should hate war itself. The both will hurt. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Koko-san. That's an incredible story. We're so grateful for your time and for joining us all the way from Japan. Um, for the for all our guests, um, please, you can have a chance to ask questions at the end if you can use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask those questions. And um, Koko-san has graciously um, said she'll answer a few questions at the end of the event. Thank you again, Koko-san. Truly an amazing story. Okay, our next speaker is Sarah Chambers. Sarah is a Japanese arts educator and advocate, surpassing 15 years of work in the museum and cultural sector. Sarah is moved by art as a way to understand the past, respond to the present, and change the future. Her professional experiences include working for various local, national, international museums, and cultural organizations, but she now also focuses her attention on audiences at home through virtual programs such as Tokyo House Party that respond to and engage with artistic communities in this moment. I recently attended a Tokyo House Party online organized by Sarah and, it was, and was greatly impressed at the carefully curated content. We'll put a link in the chat after her talk for anyone who wants to learn more. I especially enjoyed the interactive crane folding demonstration that she had um, during that Tokyo House Party. Sarah is extremely passionate about the arts and we're thrilled to have her discuss atomic art. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sheila. And of course, Kondo-san, arigatou gozaimashita. I, I feel like this is a really tough conversation to, to just jump in at this moment. But um, I think, you know, after listening to your um, compelling um, story and experiences, uh, hopefully I can illustrate what others may have been unable to convey through other forms. Not that I don't think what you've just conveyed isn't an art in itself. But um, that's kind of what I'm here to talk about today is artists and um, communities that respond to or have responded to the nuclear um, history through works of art. And knowing um, we have such a small time together today, it will be extremely brief and I will gloss over things. So please forgive me as I do this, but um, my hope is to uh, speak from the heart the whole time. So I hope you can take my sincerity where I cannot provide more context when I would like to. Um, and in thinking about this theme of why this matters today and why this conversation is so important, of course, this was the 75th anniversary of these events, but um, you know, it was just as important last year and will continue to be just as important tomorrow. Um, and the kinds of things that we'll hopefully we'll all be talking about today will illustrate that so clearly. Um, so yeah, and then thinking about how to frame this very short conversation today, um, I was thinking about categorizing different artists and different themes within things of coping and expressing loss and framing this new world that we are now are in part of, um, and educating, which for me is a flavor of activism that I like the most. Um, but uh, as I thought more about it, 
all of these artists are really kind of um, a sort of Venn diagram where this intersecting middle is all hope. So um, none really stand alone in that. They can't be distinguished and they all kind of encompass all of those hopes and aspirations. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my slideshow and to note that um, some of the imagery is difficult, but I am so happy to talk through it with all of you. Okay, so um, yes, as Sheila had mentioned um, kindly, uh, we did have a Tokyo house party on this topic um, right around the 75th anniversary in August. Um, and we had a much larger show about um, atomic art and I was hopefully just there to help others talk and I didn't get to mention some of my favorite artists and um, perspectives in this c category. And so I wanted to open this up with um, the image you can see in the background here, and it's not an easy one, and this is the one I wanted to kind of um, preface for, but um, it's really important to me. And like I said, this would be a straight from the heart conversation with all of you. Um, this is really what brought me here today, to be honest, is this artist, this companion artist. Um, and this is um, Iri and Toshi uh, Maruki, and uh, the artwork that you're seeing here is part of 15 panels called the Hiroshima panels. Uh, this is number two in the series called Fire. Um, and uh, in order to kind of keep in touch with what the feeling of this is, I wanted to, and I will show you the whole panel in just a moment, but the close up is difficult to see in that whole widespread. So I'll leave it here for a moment. Um, but uh, I wanted to give you a little more information about the Maruki couple, their husband and wife duo. Um, they lived very long lives, I want to note. Um, they both passed away into their uh, late 80s and early 90s in the last 20 years or so. But they painted these panels over the course of about 30 years. Um, they have their own museum um, where most of them are on display. Um, and you can go and visit them, which I highly recommend. I'm, um, and my ho secret hopes and dreams is to get them all to come here and get them to have an exhibit here. This is my, my hope. But uh, a quote directly from them, uh, we painted 900 human figures including the sketches for the first painting. Uh, we thought we had a large, had already painted a large number, but as many as 140,000 people died in Hiroshima. And as we continued painting, praying for the souls of the dead in hope that it will never happen again, we realized even if we painted all of our lives, we could never paint them all. One atomic bomb in one instant caused the deaths of more, than, more people than uh, we could ever portray. Long-lasting radioactivity and radiation sickness are causing people to suffer and die even now. This is not a natural disaster. As we painted through our paintings, we, uh, these thoughts ran through our minds. And so just to kind of give you some perspective about um, their, their, their entry point into making this artwork and um, understanding that this was such a daunting task and artwork certainly was a medium that they were exploring, but they even felt overwhelmed by it at times. And for each one of these panels, there's actually a prose that goes along with it. And for this particular panel, I wanna read that to you now. Pika, a strong blue white flash, the explosion, the pressure, the firestorm, never on earth or in heaven had humankind experienced such a blast. Flames burst out the next instant and left skyward. Breaking the stillness over the boundless ruins, the fire roared. Some lay unconscious, pinned by fallen beams. Others reining, others reining their senses, tried to free themselves, only to be enveloped by the crimson blaze. Glass shards pierced bellies, arms were twisted, legs buckled, people fell and were burned alive. Hugging her child, a woman fought to free herself from beneath a fallen post. Hurry, hurry, someone shouted. It's too late. Then hand us the child. No, you run, I will die with my child. She would only be left to wander in the streets. The woman pushed away the helping hands and was consumed by the flames. This is the full panel that um, is articulated along with that prose. Uh, and this was made in 1950. And to kind of call on some older Japanese artist, artistic traditions, this is a folding panel, it's, it's very large. Um, and this was painted with sumi ink as well as um, pigment and glue and charcoal and kante. So it mixes in mediums, but it uses some traditional Japanese ones as well, such as ink, the sumi ink. And I would love to give everyone, and I know we're short on time, but I, I feel like it's such a, 
it'd be such a last sentence to give you a moment to look at it. And if you have any thoughts about this that you want to jot down or think of, or how this makes you feel just looking at it, feel free to take a moment and I will make sure to share these with you um, moving forward. So the reason I bring this up is we're also talking about um, my entry point into this uh, world, which is this, this novel or this book that was given to me as my mother. And I will open and close this chat with my mother um, as she was the person who introduced me to this topic. When I was a small girl, she gave me this book and I read it. And it is a difficult book, but I loved it. And I am 37 now, and it's one of five books that I still have as an adult. So this was really meaningful to me. And um, this is the same individuals who painted, or this is the same to uh, Toshi, the wife of that couple um, illustrated all these books here. So moving forward, I wanted to bring in an art form that's a less uh, explored, and that's why I really wanted to touch base on it here. And this is Buto. Uh, Buto, um, I'm going to just not even define it because it's not something I feel comfortable defining, and it is a very intentionally obscure kind of a, um, art form. But um, if you could think of things like Kabuki and No being performances for the living, um, these individuals might say these are performances for those who have passed away. So um, this um, was a collaboration between these two artists that you're looking at here. Um, and this is um, about a little after um, the Maruki panel started to be painted. So in 1959, the two um, key founders would be Tatsumi Hijikata and Kazuo Ono. Um, and so the uh, two kanji characters, for those out there who I think might be interested in uh, Jet Alumni, <laughs> folks, um, we have, uh, they translate to dance and step. And uh, I, I encourage everyone to look at a Buto performance. I was going to put one in here, but we don't have time. Um, what's unique about this, um, it's also called the Ankoku Buto, so the dance of darkness. Um, and this isn't really talking about darkness um, in a way that I think Western thought wants us to believe that it's um, scary and, and unwelcome, but it's something that's unknown and something that you're processing. And Buto really offered people in this post-war era uh, means and artistic means of expressing um, loss and devastation and um, sadness um, through through movement and expression. And I really think this is a, oops, it won't let me advance, a wonderful um, art form that still endures. And I wanted to know that here in Chicago as well, we have different Buto artists. Uh, Buto Chicago is a local group who bring in artists um, internationally, such as Ken Mai. That's a performance that was at the Japanese Culture Center a few years ago. And then also um, we have Cyan X, who is uh, previously known as Holly Chernobyl, um, who teaches Buto classes at the Japanese Culture Center as well. Um, so this is still an expression that's being used today um, to um, um, express a, a, a myriad of, of emotions. And I wanted to note, I think this is probably why I brought it up the most as I saw this article from a friend, um, that there's a Japanese artist that normally would do buto dancing um, in, in regard to um, atomic bomb discourse um, that is now being active in New York, um, considering the COVID situation right now. So this is definitely an evolving art form. And I know I'm so short on time, so I'm gonna zip through here. Um, something kind of unexpected I wanted to bring in was um, this very, um, maybe doesn't read as artistic or an art at first, but I wanna note that it is. Um, and that is the Doomsday Clock, which also originates here in Chicago from the Journal of the, or the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And I wanted to note that this was actually um, designed by a female artist here in Chicago, Martel Langsdorf. Um, and uh, she was a landscape painter quite popular here in Chicago at the time in galleries. Um, and she, oh no, what happened? Oh, okay, yeah. This was her um, original design on the 1947 cover on the left and it was reimagined again in uh, 2007. But this is a really great example of how art can convey um, um, some of these issues that have a hard time really um, having impact in words. And so this clock was decided to be the, um, the stand-in for um, the urgency and the fear and the call to action um, from nuclear weapons. Uh, and we are at 100 seconds to midnight right now, so uh, it'll be announced again in January. We will see where we are in January this year. Uh, that said, um, this Doomsday Clock reference continues, such as in the Watchmen comics that were um, uh, created in 1986 and again in the HBO series um, just last year. So I'm trying to make these bridges as to the why now. It has not been forgotten by most people. And so seeing it incorporated into pop culture um, really helps bridge some of those gaps. 
And then of course, Sadako Sasaki. And of course you probably imagined I was gonna talk about cranes, but I think what's really compelling about this crane conversation and the folding of cranes and this very kind of um, meditative act is that anymore um, Sadako Sasaki, who, who herself has become an activist, um, sometimes uh, people will forget her name. The crane itself, the artwork itself is somehow taken over her as a person and kind of come to represent her, which for better or worse, really shows the power of artwork, I feel. And to note that um, I, I also folded this for Mimoto Sensei uh, oh, over a decade ago now. And I wanted to note that um, folding a thousand cranes is not easy. Um, this is an installation I had made and I have no idea where it is now. But I also wanted to add in that um, the, uh, I, I went and spoke to my mother's class, who my mother who gave me that book when I was a child, I went and spoke to her class about my experiences in Japan and her class folded those cranes and sent them to the Peace Park. And that's a picture of a woman in the Peace Park with the cranes that my mother's class of students folded and sent over. So the kind of full circle um, um, capabilities of art and how it's influenced across generations and uh, time, I think is exactly what brings me here today and why I'm so happy to be involved in the conversation. So that said, once again, we actually did have um, another conversation, which you can um, find the um, pre-recorded um, YouTube uh, video from that night with another local artist, Michael Corner, who creates artwork on this same topic here in Chicago. Um, and this is one of his works. It's on display, on display at Catherine Edelman Gallery. Um, you can find um, more information about Tokyo House Party in that link there. And then also to note that I talked so quickly today and there's 1 million other artists and things I would love to um, bring into this conversation. So I've left my email address there. Please feel welcome to reach out to me for any kind of casual conversations about this. Um, it's it's the my, my, my personal passion. So please don't be shy. And um, I, I hope that you will continue to dig into this conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was an amazing presentation. So often, I think our, uh, a lot of times, at least for the discussion around this, it focuses on history or politics or science. It's so wonderful to hear from the arts perspective to know how important that is um, present day as well as in the past of how that was able to help people express themselves. Thank you so much for that. Um, so now we're going to have a brief interlude. We have still have two more speakers, so definitely, um, you know, we're going to have so much more to talk about since this is such a dynamic issue. Uh, right now, we're going to, I'm going to take the, or going to give the, the mic over to uh, my fellow officers who will have a, will have a brief discussion a little bit, but feel free also to take a break if you need a glass of water or need to go to the bathroom, but we're going to facilitate a, a kind of a lively conversation here um, about uh, some topics currently about what you have learned here and also some other things related to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, so with that, I encourage um, Tyler, my fellow officer, um, to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, turn his camera on, please. So I'm not alone up here. Um, my name is Lara, or my nickname is Zara Espinoza. Quick little story is the reason I use Zara is when I was a jet um, in Japan in Shiga Prefecture, no Japanese person could say my name because L and R is very much the same sound as well as in America, people still get my name wrong. So Lara or Zara is fine to address me as. I'm the vice president of Jet A Chicago. And uh, again, I was a, a jet in Shiga Prefecture from 2010 to 2011. Um, I've been on the board for about going on almost seven, eight years. So I'm feeling very Obachan, which is grandma in uh, Japanese. But uh, also I wanna introduce uh, Tyler, our treasurer. So Tyler, do you wanna give a quick intro? Sure, thank you, Lara. So, uh, my name is Tyler Blaze. I'm treasurer for Jet A Chicago. Um, I was uh, an ALT on the the uh, Jet program several years ago. Um, and yeah, like uh, like Lara was saying, we're just here. Feel free if you guys um, need to take a break, need to get up and get some water, or go to the bathroom. But uh, Lara and I are just going to kind of start this conversation about. Um, some of the things that we are starting to take away from these conversations and these incredible presentations um, and, and hope to kind of continue that on here. Uh, we're going to enable the chat functionality so we can kind of track some of our conversations. Feel free to continue um, submitting via the, via the Q&A uh, feature as well. We'll continue to take those questions and um, save those for later so that the presenters will be able to address those questions. But um, yeah, I think that we're going to just take a little bit of time here and we can, again, use the chat functionality to answer uh, some questions about what we've learned so far. 
Um, so thank you, Tyler. With that said, we do have some of our speakers on camera, so you're getting a preview or just more face time with them. Um, if everyone can hopefully see the screen that uh, Gabriel just shared, um, the question on the screen is, what is one thing, at least one thing, that you were surprised to learn from Coco and Sarah's presentations? I know there was a lot of information in there to very dynamic speakers. I just, I, I, I cried during uh, Coco-san's uh, story and I smiled and laughed and got really giddy when I saw comic books and Sarah's um, presentation. Um, feel free to, again, uh, Gabriel should have put the chat function on to please those who, of you who are attending are still at your computers um, to share the things that you learn in the chat um, so our speakers can see them and see your feedback. Again, constructive things only and also, you know, Please introduce yourself in the chat so we can kind of see who's here right now. Um, include your name, your pronouns, which are optional, as it says here on the screen, your location, city, and state. I know we might have some people um, dialing in from other countries as well. So if you can include your country if you are. And also indicate if you're one of the, well, one of the three, um, a JET alumni. Uh, fellow JET alumni. I know we have quite a few on this call. Um, a friend of JET. So a friend of JET is our great supporters who did not go on the JET program but are just as important. Um, as well as if you're a DePaul or Panoma College student, I know that uh, Miyamoto Sensei and also uh, Tom, or Professor Tom Lay, will be very happy to see their students here um, and supporting them. So seeing anything interesting in the chat, Tyler? Yeah, so I, uh, it, again, feel free to kind of use the chat as you will, um, you know, everyone in the audience now, if you'd like to introduce yourself, thanks for explaining, Laura, introduce yourself um, and kind of even put in your own thoughts and opinions based on some of the speakers so far. Um, but I believe we saw something about the change of heart uh, that came over Koko-san uh, kind of at that time. And I don't know, you know, similar to Lara, you know, feeling like, you know, at the edge of my seat and about to cry. Um, I, I don't know how I would have dealt with emotions such as that. I, I can't even comprehend, you know, holding so much, you know, anger and, and misunderstanding um, and, you know, questioning as, as well as hatred and uh, having that just transform in that moment. Um, maybe not completely, maybe completely, you know, I, I think there's so much nuance there, but it was really incredible to see how that kind of you know, in Kokostan in your experience, how that kind of came to be. And especially at such a young age, I, you know, can't tell you one thing that I did of uh, renowned at age 10. So <laughs> I think it's really incredible to hear your, you know, opinions on that. And I definitely echo that sentiment. Yeah, no, thank you, Tyler, for sure. I mean, for me, I, I did think it was really cute. <laughs> it was cute, but also sad um, and a little funny when, uh, uh, Mr. Hershey misgendered a uh, Coco San. Um, I completely understand how that can happen. And also it's just, it's very sweet that he corrected the book um, for her, um, which is in its custom corrected. So that's even better. Um, with that too, just a reminder to everyone in the audience as well, um, please submit questions that you have for Sarah and Coco um, in the chat. Or if you already, if you look through the program that we put together and you see something that Tom might talk about or, um, uh, Miyamoto Sensei will talk about too. You feel free to submit a question directly to them even earlier than their presentations. If you don't mind noting the name if they're one to a specific person, or you could just be like for all panelists, or we're going to assume that if you do not indicate a name, that any panelist could answer it as well. I'm seeing a lot of Panoma College students. Um, so, Tom, you should be very proud that your students are here. Um, I see a lot of JET alumni in the chat. Um, let me see. Ooh, we also have Al Alexa or Alexa, sorry if I'm pretty mispronounced your name, um, who is actually a Nagasaki Jet, which is amazing. Um, I, I love, I didn't get to go to Nagasaki, but I got to um, go to Hiroshima, which is my favorite, favorite city in Japan. It's just so cool, especially, um, I'm a big fan of Hiroshima style Okonomiyaki. For those of you who don't know what that is, Okonomiyaki is like a Japanese pancake with cabbage. It's very savory, but uh, Hiroshima no Okonomiyaki tends to have uh, the noodles, like yakisoba noodles on the bottom, which makes it very unique and delicious. Um, but Tyler, have you been to Hiroshima or Nagasaki? I have. I've been to Hiroshima. I've not been to Nagasaki. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was just, we were trying to do a little traveling in the south and 
could only hit up a few places. But um, yeah, it, it, it was a very historical trip. I think a lot of every, everyone who goes there, a lot of people will you know, note the, the history um, significance, especially for Americans when, when traveling there. Um, but terrifically beautiful city as well. Um, of course, can't help but take in the natural beauty, but yeah, very, um, very educational trip, which I really got a lot out of. Yeah, I'm no, seeing sure. some, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I'm also seeing some interest in the chat for uh, Buto, which I also, Buto, I, I'm not sure of my Jap, uh, Japanese pronunciation, but uh, very interesting. You know, I, I don't think I'd come across that art form before and um, really would be interesting to see kind of how that presents itself and, you know, maybe looking into that a little bit more after this. Yeah, I think our one of our partners, the Japanese Cultural Center, um, really has done some cool events with it there. I have yet to go to one, so I'm sorry, Japanese Cultural Center, um, but promise. Uh, and you know, me, I used to do dancing. I was a dancer in Japan, actually, in hip hop dancing. And one of my teammates actually did buto dancing, but whenever I asked them to do it for me, they were too shy. Um, so hopefully I will get to see it live. Um, I do see Keiko, thank you Keiko for sharing. Um, uh, that cool video link in the chat and oh, more Panoma College students. I think I saw a couple DePaul students, uh, Yuki, so we're you're good there too and much loved um, from here. Oh, we oh we have another Nagasaki uh, ALT or JET. Also really great to see. We see Wesley here from the Japan Amer <clears throat> American, Japanese American Service Committee, not Service Committee, Japan America Society, two JASCs here in Chicago. Anything else you're seeing interesting from people, what they've learned in the chat, Tyler? Um, yeah, definitely. So a uh, little bit on Captain, Captain Lewis as well. And, um, you know, obviously there's a going based off of Koko-san's conversation of, you know, does, does a person who, uh, you know, commits an action like that, do they really have awareness of what they're doing? You know, how, you know, how far down in the war machine is this, you know, individual who really is a human, who really is a human who, you know, Koko San went and grabbed his hand and held his hand and, you know, felt that connection. Um, not only the, you know, transformation of the emotions that she felt, but also, you know, who is this person who was behind the act that, um, you know, it's a question on humanity and, and, you know, what was that person thinking when it happened and after it happened. So uh, definitely opens it up to, uh, you know, a lot of interesting dialogue there as well. Um, you know, and unfortunate that Koko San wasn't necessarily able to meet him, um, you know, before he passed, but still really powerful. The, you know, the lasting effect that had that had on her and, you know, others as well. I couldn't agree more. And just I, someone had wrote in the chat too about the whole, how much empathy that Koko-san had. And I think, again, especially in the world that we're in today, how stressful it is with the social and racial injustices and unrest, as well as COVID-19 pandemic. It's been quite the year 2020 and it's only September. Um, and I, one thing I think this year, um, I hope many people, including myself, you know, have really manifested is that sense of empathy, which is, you know, to be able to not just put yourself in someone else's shoes, but feel what they feel as best as possible. It's not, there's uh, one of my favorite um, uh, speakers, Brene Brown said like the difference between empathy and sympathy is sympathy builds distance. Like for example, well, at least you survived Hiroshima versus empathy, which builds connection, um, which would be instead of like, well, at least you did this and putting distance be like, well, I'm really glad that you survived Hiroshima Koko-san and that you're here with us today all the way from Japan. Um, so I just think that's just such a, great takeaway um, from this, especially in the world today, though, you know, it's tough out there, for sure. I know we're going to probably keep going for just a couple of minutes. If there's any other cool findings in there, Tyler, let me know. But again, everyone keep the chat going for right now. Um, we will because we want to focus and give respect to our speakers, um, be turning the chat off once um, Tom starts presenting. So get your get your chitter chatter out quick. And again, if you need to use the restroom, time to do it now. Go get a drink, bite to eat, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, chat. Looking at the chat right now, Tyler, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, no, definitely a lot. And I know some, I, I apologize if we don't get to everyone. I do know that um, if you've been typing for a little bit, crafting up the uh, introduction and your opinions, we're, we're kind of starting to see them now. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think I think the empathy is definitely coming across. Kind of, we have some comments on maturity, um, and you know, individuals in, in 
Kokosan situation and many others uh, kind of having to come to a certain level of emotional maturity that you know young children are not expected to be at uh, you know especially when you're younger and you don't have to kind of weigh these heavier um, you know opinions and, and and actions that have happened to you so I think there's definitely something to be you know thought about there um, you know the things that we were doing when we were you know not even one year old yet and then you know six years old and ten years old so uh, very different in terms of uh, an individual's upbringing yeah I know that Thanks for bringing that up again, Tyler. And then um, Tara, who I believe is joining us from the West Coast here. So I hope Tara, you and the rest of all the Jets on the West Coast are doing all right, despite the fires and better air quality going on right now in our current times. Um, with that, uh, Tara did make a mention of Sarah's presentation of the painting of Eerie and Toshi. Um, something about like with their quote, it really gripped her or, and um, you know, she said that or they had seen screen painting that exists before. So that I'm really jealous. I wish I could see that in person one day. Um, so with that too, speaking of the West Coast, I did want to give a special shout out to anyone here and also even here in spirit, um, the Jet Alumni Association of Southern California and Arizona or Jet ASC. They are another chapter within our Jet ecosystem of alumni. Um, people and we partnered with them. They co-sponsored this event with us because we have um, Tom who is our next speaker who should be getting ready to go. Um, right now is um, located in the Southern California area as well as we know we have some fellow students of his who are on the call and so we wanted to make sure to get Jets in the area also showing them love. So thank you so much Jet ASC, especially their board members for helping us get the word out and making sure that we had over um, you're almost sold out. We had over 80 people register for the event and we had over 80% attendance. So eight is great and it's infinite. Uh -huh. um, so anything else, Tyler, before we hand the reins back to Sheila and then to Tom? Uh, I think that's it for me. Yeah, I'm definitely good to hand it back over. All right, cool. Well, then we're signing off. This is Laura and Tyler from Jetty Chicago, all the way here in Chicago, Illinois, representing Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. And back to you, Sheila. Thank you so much, Lara and Tyler. Uh, right, I, we really wanted this be, to be an interactive event, so I really appreciated um, both of you facilitating that discussion. And for everyone who um, ch mentioned comments in the chat box, we really appreciate that. It, we definitely keep it going when we um, turn it back on, and for the hopefully for the Q and A se section, we'll get um, to, to a lot of your questions. So right now, I am going to introduce Tom Lee, who is coming to um, from us from Pom Pomono College. He is an assistant professor of politics at Pomona College, specializing in Japanese security policy, war memory and reconciliation, East Asia regionalism, and militar militarism norms. Lee's work has been published by the Journal of Asian Security and International Affairs and the Journal of Asian Studies, as well as in popular outlets such as Foreign Affairs, The Washington Post, The Hill, and The Diplomat. Lee received a PhD in political science from the University of California, Irvine, and BAs in history and political science at the University of California, Davis. He is a research associate at the Prime Institute at Meiji Gakuen University, a CSIS US ROK Next Gen Fellow, and an AFIHJ Next Generation Fellow. His work has been supported by the Fulbright Program, the Japan Foundation, the Korea, the Korea Foundation, CION Trust and JSSO. I first met Tom in 2012 at the Hiroshima and Peace Program when he was finishing his PhD and I was finishing my tenure on the JET program. When I introduced myself as a JET from Toyama, he told me that his wife is from Toyama, the tiny prefecture where I taught junior high school. The connection of JET is truly powerful. Tom is a beautiful writer and extremely giving individual who I know is passionate about improving political discourse around security policy and in helping students achieve their goals. Tom students, you are definitely in good hands. Tonight, Tom will be speaking about Japan's aging peace, demographics, memory, and activism. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sheila. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, thank you, Kondo-san, for your, your, your testimony, your powerful testimonial, and also Sarah's presentation on the art, uh, which reminds me, uh, we actually have official prints of those arts here at Pomona now, and we're supposed to put up an exhibit, so, uh, the students that are from Pomona, if you're hearing me, we got to do this once uh, we get back in person. Um, and also this kind of reminds me of all the connections that exist. Uh, I met Sheila in Hiroshima and also I applied for JET when I was undergrad. I didn't get it and it's kind of neat to be able to come back at least to share some of my uh, research today. Uh, so 
Today, I'm going to talk about the idea of aging and demographics and how this has affected the, the peace movement and memory. It's something, maybe a different angle to think about how things are remembered. Uh, so first, I would begin to look at, um, you know, August 6th and 9th, uh, 1945. And uh, I think it's important to think about how the legacy of nuclear weapons continues and has far-reaching impact. So the, the fact that the, the nuclear weapons were used um, had an immediate impact on the individuals that suffered from its use. But also, it changed the global context in which the people that live today are still dealing with the consequences of dealing with proliferation of North Korea, are still dealing with uh, you know, these countries that have vertical and horizontal proliferation. We're, we're seeing more nuclear weapons in the world. They're much more powerful. And that really shapes the decision making of leaders today, how much you spend on the military and how much you spend on social welfare. Uh, so it, it really has shaped our lives. Similarly, how we think about nuclear weapons today and how we remember it will be very important for the next generation, our kids and our grandkids. Uh, and so it's still an issue that uh, we are dealing with, right? In, in a sense, it was Pandora's box and, and we're still trying to put everything back in. Uh, but in, uh, but uh, it actually has fundamentally changed um, the political context and also um, just the, de the, the development of our, our people. And so I like to think about this in terms of intergenerational exploitation. And this is a theory by Matthew Rendell, where he argues that the longer we don't solve for nuclear weapons today, the more we are exploiting the next generation. For instance, we can assume that nuclear weapons will be used one day. It's almost a mathematical certainty, right? It's either gonna be used accidentally, it'll be used for its intended purpose for defeating an enemy. It might be a mechanical failure, right? As long as we have 20,000 nuclear weapons on this planet, one day it will be used. So even though we may feel secure today, there will be a point where it will be used and we will not be secure tomorrow. So it's something that we have to address today. Um, so I wanna move on now to talk about memory. Um, and if we think about memory of nuclear weapons, uh, what it felt like to be a victim of nuclear weapons, um, we have to think of memory as a, kind of like a snapshot of reality, right? We have. Uh, Academic research is telling us one side of the story. We have testimonials. Uh, they're different perspectives. So, um, and they're imperfect. Uh, and it becomes increasingly imperfect over time. So if we think about uh, A-bomb survivors or Hibaksha, uh, they're a valuable resource because they're a specific type of information, a type of data that cannot be replicated. Uh, sure, we can record their testimonials, but there's something different about having the opportunity to, to listen to Kondo-san's testimonial in person and to hear it or to interact with them and to have those uh, serendipitous uh, powerful moments where she met the, the co-pilot uh, of the Enola Gay. And even though we may have their information recorded and written down, we will not get those moments that I think can be quite inspiring and can affect people. So I think as the population ages, it will affect how memory is recorded and how we engage with nuclear weapons. So uh, as of uh, March 2019, which is uh, the latest year where there was data uh, related to A-bomb survivors, there were 136, uh, 682 survivors remaining, uh, and the average age was 83.31, right? So if we do the math, that means that when the nuclear weapons, atomic bombs were first dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the average person was eight years old, which is probably as young as you can be that you can remember the event with clarity, like it, it, that, that you remember what happened, what you saw. So we really are at a tipping point now where the last generation of individuals who remember the event are still alive to share their experience. Um, and, uh, and additionally, I would add that that experience uh, can change over time, right? There's a difference between a testimonial and telling a narrative. So for instance, uh, if an individual uh, survived a nuclear weapon, they could talk about how hot it was, uh, what they saw, but that moment, they wouldn't be able to tell you the exact temperature. They would not be able to tell you that strategic purpose. They would not tell you about the greater narrative that was going on because it was just an immediate experience, kind of like when you go to uh, the store and you buy something. You could, if you're really describing your experience, you would just talk about grabbing something and what you see. And everything beyond that, if you talked about what was going on that day, is additional information that was added. So what we'll see over time is the history of 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki will have additional information that did not come from the original experience. It will come from popular media. It will come from scientific research. It will come from uh, opinion editorials. So our, our relationship with history will change as the population ages and as Hibakusha, uh, the population declines. Additionally, I would like to uh, kind of propose to you the idea of what happens when Japan's population is declining significantly. And so what I'm finding with my research is Japan is the, the first world, the world's first hyper aged society uh, in which by the year 2050, 40% of the population will be over the age of 65. Uh, and the general population will decline to 88 million, which is 35% less than it was in 2010. Uh, and so what you're getting is a, a smaller population of young people. And so I believe that that demographic shift will affect how Japanese people will remember history. So as Kondo-san uh, was talking about how her views changed about looking at war as this kind of this evil that's universal, um, I'm, I'm curious if that will be the case with the new generation of Japanese who are young, who are further away from the event and who will have other pressures on their lives where war is not as immediate. So I, I'd like to transition now to look at how war is, uh, how the nuclear weapons are remembered in Japan. So uh, I do some research on peace museums. So in the uh, in Japan's a unique place in which they don't have uh, that many war museums, uh, such as um, 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 like a kind of a, a history of just like conflict. They, they, they frame it in terms of uh, peace museums. And so there are 76 peace museums in Japan, which are the most in the world. And they're in 32 of the 47 prefectures. And if you know, Japan is about the size of California. So each prefecture is like their version of a state. So in 32 of the 47 states, there's a peace museum. And um, if you put it in the Google Maps, there's actually no spot in Japan that is more than two hours via train from a peace museum. So really, it's part of the physical discourse. Uh, in Japan. So I, I argue that it's very much important part in maintaining the memory of nuclear weapons and A-bomb survivors and, and continuing uh, the education going forward. And um, I look at some of the population uh, data and I, I think it's quite interesting how young people are learning about nuclear weapons from it. So in 2019, there was 1.7 million visitors to um, the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, which is uh, a, a significant increase. It was a record number, actually. But for students, Japanese students in Japan, it was a decrease from 500,000 in 1985 to uh, around 300,000 in 2007. And then that number has held steady uh, since then. Uh, so the population of young people going to these museums has decreased. So some may wonder, like, does this mean that Jap young Japanese don't care anymore? However, the overall population of young Japanese uh, from elementary school to high school has also decreased by 43%. So it actually maps on perfectly with the decline in student visitors to these peace museums. What I, I find interesting is, is that the actual number of trips, like so organized school trips to these peace museums in Japan have not only remained steady, but have increased for the elementary school students. Now for high school students, uh, it has declined. And my, my guess is because uh, travel is much more cheaper. So uh, older students now can travel to other countries for their school trip uh, and younger students go locally. Uh, but within uh, Japan, every year, one million students gr graduate and enter elementary school. And within the six year period of elementary school in Japan, 900,000 students went to the Peace Museum. So what that tells me is there's a high likelihood that every single young person in Japan will spend at least a day visiting at least, uh, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum or the Nakasagi Atomic Bomb Museum or any of the other 75 museums. So if you think about um, as a culture, that's interesting to see that young people have this part uh, visiting these sites as part of their education, that visceral experience uh, they're getting. Uh, and, and also because there's fewer students but more trips, that means that their groups are getting smaller. That means they're getting more attention from their instructor or from their guides about the experience. So they're getting a more intimate education because the population is declined. So I think that's uh, an interesting development uh, because the population has gone smaller. Uh, I'll, the last thing I'll talk about is what's going on with the peace movements today. Uh, and where this is where I, I um, concern's not the right word, uh, but uh, a development. So as I mentioned before, Japan is a rapidly aging and declining population. And if you look at the leaders of the, the peace movement, 
um, they are on the higher end in the age group. Um, and for the most part, uh, the peace groups are losing some steam because they're having difficulty replenishing their ranks for activism. So some things that trends that you notice due to this decline is one is the leadership do not get paid. They rely on the pension system in order to fund their life and for them to be able to do these activities. Uh, so Japan's robust social welfare state is actually one thing that contributes to the survival of the peace uh, movement. Uh, additionally, uh, young people find it difficult to stay in, uh, to be an activist and work at NGOs for a long time because the, the money is so low and because there's so many economic opportunities in the general economy because there's young, there's just so few young people. Um, so uh, it's, I, I'm curious how in the next 10 to 15 years, how the peace movement will evolve uh, as the, the kind of the vanguards of the movement uh, make way for the younger generation who I believe are getting educated on the peace movement, but may not be able to make a living off of it. And therefore, it will be very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, maintain this momentum uh, that exists. So uh, if we're thinking about time, uh, the time is now actually, it's, it's more important than ever to kind of care about these issues and do as much as you can to, uh, to lay the foundation uh, for the peace movement uh, for the next uh, 20, 30, 40, or 75 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, it truly is interesting to think about what is going to happen in the next decade. And so um, with the aging population, and I think the, the, the fact that uh, we currently have the ability to listen for, to firsthand experience is extremely powerful. So I hope all, all of you here, um, thank you for taking the time. And I hope that this experience is something that you'll remember. So our next um, final speaker, but certainly, certainly not last, is Yuki Miyamoto from DePaul University. Um, since having earned her PhD from the University of Chicago, she has been teaching courses on nuclear ethics and environmental ethics at DePaul University. Her works include a monograph, Beyond the Mushroom Cloud, Commemoration, Religion, and Responsibility After Hiroshima, and several articles. Her most recent publication examines the nuclear discourse in the U.S. and another monograph on environmental ethics, A World Otherwise, Environmental Praxis in Mina Minamata, sorry, will be out in early 2021. She has led two week-long study abroad programs, bringing DePaul students to Hiroshima and Nagasaki seven times, and has been managing the Atomic Age website. We will put that in the chat, that is definitely a great website. She was appointed as Nagasaki Peace Correspondent in 2010 and Hiroshima Peace Ambassador in 2011. I am grateful for all the guest speakers tonight, but have to give a special shout out to Miyamoto Sensei, who I know is Yuki. As I mentioned earlier, she helped put us in contact with Koko-san and helped shape our discussion, especially the focus on, modern, on the present day and modern day. Please, let's all give a virtual applause to Yuki. Um, students of DePaul who are joining us, you're so lucky to have Yuki as a professor. I first met her when I requested to interview her for a story on the survivors I was writing for my master's thesis. Yuki has since become a friend and also one of my heroes in life. Sarah, I know you mentioned before that I think you call her Saint Yuki, I thought you mentioned, and I thought that was a perfect description. I wholeheartedly agree. If I had to choose two words to describe her, it would be brilliant and generous. She is so passionate about the legacy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and has inspired me to think more critically on important ethical issues surrounding nuclear weapons and nuclear power. Tonight, Yuki will be speaking on why we should care now. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, that, that is way, way generous introduction. I don't think I'm, I'm living up to that, but I, I will try. And it's so nice to work with people whom I know and I got to know. And um, I'm hoping that this is going to be um, um, long-term friendship. And also, I'm, I very much appreciate my students at DePaul University and Tom's students at Pomo, Pomo, uh, sorry, Pomona University. Um, because we also want to talk with younger people, not just to tell you what, you know, what we are thinking, but also I would very much like to learn from you as well. So I would like to invite you to write questions in the uh, uh, Q&A box. That would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, so today's work, uh, today's talk, let me share. Um, this is 
uh, a look back to move forward. But my talk is Why Should We Care, which is very a provocative title. But this was inspired by the subtitle of today's event, which is a discussion on the modern day importance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In other words, uh, what's the significance in modern day? Um, so that's what I want to sort of challenge to you, but also I, I'm planning to provide some answers as well. Why should we care? Uh, because it was 75 years ago and that happened in Japan and that was the former enemy. Not only that, but also geographically and emotionally a distant place, right? And the bombs and the chronologically distant place 75 years ago. And also the bombs, two bombs ended the war swiftly, which I will, uh, uh, I will contest later, but the bombs saved American lives uh, and as well as Japanese lives. So those are the kind of narratives which we might be familiar with in growing up. And nuclear arms have not been used since, which I also contest. And lastly, the nuclear arms have have protected us because it has not been used since 1945. So we have to have them in order to protect ourselves from the rogue nations, whatever those nations are, or terrorist groups. And this is the kind of basic understanding or underpinnings of this nuclear deterrent theory, right? So everyone has it, so that's why, and everyone knows how devastating it would be. So therefore, that actually deters us or anyone, any agency from using it. So that's the nuclear deterrent theory. But I would challenge all those sort of premises, uh, especially let me begin with the last two bullet points. Um, estimated global nuclear war warhead inventories. Uh, if I had time and if I had, uh, if I could see you audience, uh, I would probably like to ask the question. So, um, how many bombs do you think we have as a world? And we are talking about global warming and climate change. And actually we have these many nuclear weapons. And also we are talking about how education is suffering from the budget uh, restraint and other infrastructures. Um, but on the other hand, we have these many nuclear weapons which we have actually spent resources. And it has not been used, the nuclear arm, uh, nuclear weapons, weaponry has not been used since 1945. So let me challenge this. And again, I usually ask the audience, um, how many countries do you think you ha uh, do you think that have nuclear weapons? And especially those countries which have nuclear tests. And instead of uh, calling on you, I will give you the answer here. Uh, this is an alphabetical order, China, uh, France, India, North Korea, Pakistan, UK, and the US. And uh, some people might think Germany, but Germany itself doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, however, they have US bases. They might have some um, nuclear weapons deployed over there, um, but I don't count as a nuclear country, the Germany nuclear countries or Italy as nuclear countries. And also, except India, North Korea, Pakistan, um, oh shoot, I, oh USSR, sorry. So those eight countries and uh, except India, North Korea and Pakistan, those five countries, remained five countries are actually the nuclear, um, uh, the UN Security Council countries, which are not democratically chosen, but those, those seats are given to those five countries, and those five countries are all nuclear countries. Um, other thing is, I, I would like to mention, is that Israel uh, most likely have it, but Israel has not officially admitted to their possession of nuclear weapons. So I'm not uh, actually counting here. And South Africa, which used to have some nuclear weapons, but they gave up. Uh, sounds like a good story, but actually what happened to South Africa was that when the regime changed from the apartheid to more democratic regime, uh, some apartheid uh, you know, white regime didn't want to leave the weapons to the other hands. So that's why they kind of dissembled nuclear weapons. 
so um, well actually I would very much like to invite Sarah here because this is a kind of art form art expression of the um, nuclear weapon the horror of nuclear weapons and you might be able to identify what this is this is 1954 Gojira which became to Godzilla a little bit uh, uh, a slight rendition of 1954 Gojira and Godzilla is actually inspired by or, or triggered by this event took place on March 1st in 1954 the lucky dragon incident and what it, what it was, was um, this tuna, sh tuna ship went to uh, the South Pacific to catch tuna and they were told not to come to a certain area because that air designated area was the uh, range of the US nuclear test site. So they were outside of the designated area, but the bomb which was tested was far bigger than the scientists had anticipated. So what happened was those crew actually saw the light and also the roar and got the nuclear fallout. And um, so you can see on the left, upper left side of picture is the uh, radio communicator, Kuboyama Aikichi's photo and the bereaved families. He passed away six months later from acute radiation sickness. And the bottom right photo shows that tuna that was, that was caught not only by this, this uh, tuna ship, which is called Lucky Dragon Number no. 5, but also there are many other ships out there catching tuna. But when they brought back tuna, actually the ra radiation was detected. So that actually shook Japan, and that was the beginning of the peace movement. Uh, so that actually is tied up tied into uh, Tom's story um, because it, it has been nine years since the end of the war, people thought that they, they survived. Um, however, even if you were not in the war, you were not involved in the war, you could be the victim of radioactive materials or radiation. So that really shook people in Japan and that became, that brought about many uh, anti-nuclear movements and organizations and Godzilla. So nuclear tests, let's talk about nuclear tests since Godzilla was a, a product of this nuclear test. Um, I also ask questions to the audience usually, like how many tests have been done? And the smallest number would be Pakistan twice. And the next one is India three times. And we are so afraid of North Korea. And I know that they have a different, uh, you know, political system. So of course, it's, it's harder to wholeheartedly trust uh, North Korean regime. However, having said that, North Korea did six nuclear tests, which is actually disproportionately small compared to other countries. So let's take a look at other big nuclear countries. Uh, so eight countries which has nuclear tested so far, and we are down, down with Pakistan, India, North Korea. So five countries are left. Which one do you think the next? is a fun question if I could see you if we are face to face. Uh, so next one is China, 43. So the number actually just jumped here. And UK, 45. And the UK actually used the Nevada test site in the United States as a collabor collaborative um, uh, training. And also they used Christmas Island, which is, in, which is a kind of ironic name in the Pacific. And France, actually 214. And interestingly, I will show you the world map where those tests were done. Um, but France actually came in this nuclear arms race a little bit late. So they were trying hard to catch up. So next one is USSR, uh, uh, present day uh, Russia. Uh, not, not exactly, much smaller now Russia, but USSR. Um, 715. So the last one, the US, 1032 nuclear tests. And you can see 
we just listened to Coco san's testimony and how one bomb which 75 years ago was destructive physically but emotionally as well and so now you can see this picture that how small even Hiroshima bomb could be. Not, not that I, I'm downplaying the magnitude of Hiroshima bomb, but I just want to play up the how ridiculously large the um, recent nuclear weapons. And of course, after this, um, the, the largest one, which is very famous, you can find um, YouTube video about tsar bomb which was exploded in 1961 however um, after this it's actually becoming smaller but more efficient or more pinpointly uh, targeting so that's the nuclear weapons so far and also radioactive materials uh, for example uh, the most most harmful radio radionuclides which is plutonium Plutonium's half-life is 24,000 years. So, you know, even though this test was how many years ago? Like 60 years ago or so, or 70 years ago? But that's not even half-life of plutonium. So we are still under the mushroom cloud after over 2,000 nuclear tests worldwide and nuclear explosion since 1945. And you can see interesting maps here. For example, France, they did nuclear tests in a former colony, Algeria, or uh, French Pacific Islands. Or these are the Bikini Atoll Marshall Islands. And this is the place where uh, the, the, the tuna fishing boat was caught by the nuclear fallout. And of course, we did um, Nevada and California. Um, the closest test site from Chicago would be um, Missouri, I think. And again, uh, so one bomb or, or the test, the atmospheric tests, affects this far. Uh, so this is a visual, um, visual. Uh, demonstration, illustration of how far the radioactive materials could get carried, uh, get carried away. And this is atmospheric. And actually, um, one third of the tests was done in the atmospheric, in the air, and one third under the ground, one third under the water. Um, but I don't think under the ground and under the water are um, environmentally and health-wise better than uh, atmospheric ones because most of, of the places our water comes from the underground aquifer and also um, the water like the um, in the pacific under the water tests um, of course in the same way that radioactive materials are uh, like going around the globe with the current, right? And so that's why the Japanese government is trying to, not, not that's why, um, actually that's relevant because now the Japanese government is trying to release the contaminated water, which they call it treated water, uh, into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and just a couple of days ago, they, they tried to convince people how safe it is at at IAEA meeting in Geneva, um, but I think I think we need to be very careful to release any kind of radioactive materials. And the reason is the nuclear weapons are not only harmful when they are exploded. Uh, let me see. Let's start with the very left one, which is uranium mine. This is from Arizona. But American West has many uranium mines, which we are not, most of them were not being used, but we don't close them because if we close them, we have to decontaminate the area. So that's kind of abandoned, open. Uh, so of course, the area is the um, usually Native Americans reservations area. So people who are suffering from this are um, fellow Americans. And the middle one is Hanford, and you can see 
Columbia River is running through, most of the nuclear facilities are built near the uh, water, water sources. For example, Chicago or Illinois and Midwest, uh, most of the nuclear, nuclear reactors are built um, along Lake Michigan because it needs massive amount of water to cool down the reactors, which means the water which was used to cool down the reactors go out after a couple of degrees warmer. So it actually contributes to the global warming uh, because warming up the water source and uh, thereby the um, biodiversity is changing. And lastly, uh, St. Louis, I want to talk a little bit about St. Louis because this is a nuclear waste. St. Louis is not much known because it's different from national facility or federal or national or uh, military facilities like Hanford or Los Alamos or Oak Ridge. Um, but St. Louis has this chemical company which was um, enriching the uranium which was imported from Belgium, Congo back then uh, under Belgium re regime. Congo, and they enrich the uranium, but enriching process produce, produces lots of waste. And so this is the waste and some was buried and some was just abandoned. And finally, and it's a, it's a private company. So uh, the liability became very obscure afterwards because new company bought the company uh, that split up, merged, split up, uh, bought by another company. Uh, so because of that, we don't know for sure who should be responsible. Now the Army Corps of Engineers is trying to decontaminate. Um, but 70 years later, people who are living in this area realized that there are so many cancer cases and then they found out what had happened in 1945. So the, in a way, legacy is not just in Japan, but also in the United States. And also it, it's not a, uh, it, was, it was done at the time of the explosion in 1945. And you can see the cancer cases in St. Louis so those are the questions that I started with my presentation. It was 75 years ago in Japan, uh, you know, far away people um, ended the war swiftly, yada, yada, yada. The nuclear arms have not been used to since. So I challenged uh, last two and now I want to move on to this. Um, also, I want to a little bit piggyback on Tom's presentation, which he's talking about the legacy and how to hand down their experiences, which is, which is difficult. And uh, I know the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are trying, but most likely handing down someone else's experiences is almost impossible. However, what we could do is we can hand down, we can carry on the legacy of their wishes, their desires to end the nuclear weapons, to abolish nuclear weapons, because their wishes are um, like no one should suffer like us. And uh, as Koko san was saying, that it's it's the war. We have to end the war. We have to uh, we have to eliminate nuclear weapons. So those wishes we can carry on and that's the way that we can form the friendship between uh, Japan and the United States and the references. Um, so forming the, forming the friendship is not necessarily just talking, um, just learning about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is, which is wonderful. I'm actually very impressed by many people who actually have been to or who want to go there, uh, either Hiroshima and Nagasaki or both, um, but also finding some people who are suffering here now is another way to to be connected to them to be connected with Kokosan, to be connected with hibaksha those uh, witness of the atomic bombs uh, so the, these are references the a bombs ended the war swiftly and this adam goodhart which uh, who is contested this sort of myth and the second one, the A-bomb saved American lives, usually 500,000 US lives saved, which was uh, actually the number was inflated after a couple of months, uh, a couple of months after the bombing of Hiroshima, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, 
And also, this number was used in Truman's autobiography. So it became kind of the fact, uh, but it's actually not true. That's what a historian at Stanford, Barton Bernstein, uh, did an archival research and proved it. The nuclear arms protect us. I have uh, several essays or several um, autobiographies by Kristen Iverson, who grew up in uh, Rocky Flats in Colorado. And that's also a very contaminated area because there was a facility to put together nuclear weapons. And Sarah Alisbeth Fox, downwind, she's talking about the West, American West is actually the nuclear West. Trisha Pritik in the very recent publication, she grew up in Hanford and she is suffering from, she lost her parents to uh, radiation-induced illnesses, and also she herself is suffering. So I hope that this story um, is not just the, you know, um, people who happened to be there 75 years ago, um, but also because we listen to Koko-san's story, I hope that each one of us carries her legacy by um, being connected with those people who are suffering from radiation and the nuclear weapons worldwide. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuki, for those important reminders. Uh, the stats you showed about the uh, number of sheer number of tests and the power of the current technology is truly chilling. So thank you for those uh, very important reminders and um, talking about the importance of this present day discussion. Um, one, before we lead into our formal Q&A session, I just want to say thank you for sticking with us to the audience. I know we're a few minutes late, but uh, we're going to wrap up in about the next 10 minutes. Before we lead into our formal Q&A um, session, I did want to ask one quick one related to um, Yuki's talk. A good question was, when you say nuclear tests, what do you mean exactly? Does that include something other than launching nuclear weapons? Um, when you were showing those? That was a question from the audience. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, nuclear tests meaning actual, involving actual explosion. Um, so I do not count those computer simulation, which is subcritical, subcritical tests. I do not include those because we had several uh, during, during Obama administration as well. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we're going to enter into our formal uh, Q&A session that Laura and myself will help facilitate. Um, we have received so many great questions. This is a very smart audience, so I'm so impressed with all of the questions. We had some pre-submitted questions that we're going to get to first, and we're going to try to get to a few of the questions that were submitted during the discussions. Uh, we apologize if we can't get to all of them because we're behind on time, um, but we do appreciate all of the questions that everyone has asked. Um, so the first one is for uh, Koko-san that was pre-submitted. Following the tragic events, how did you cope with what happened? How were you affected economically? Did you receive help from the government or anyone else? Uh, for uh, the in case of Japan, uh, the survivors in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, we have to submit. And the person who will get the, how shall I say, sort of, you know, notebook, the, the, the showing that the person is a survivor. If, for example, like me, if I get a sickness, I have to bring my uh, uh, health insurance and uh, this notebook. Then the government take care of my uh, physical you know, expenses. But in order to get this notebook, I have to have a two witness. And <clears throat> probably uh, you already know that many of the survivors, right after the disaster, they were afraid of the discrimination. So they don't want to appeal. They don't want to show that, that, that they are the survivors. They're so they did not submit to this notebook. But now, 75 years passed, everybody getting old and you know, so many sickness occur. So if they have a you know, notebook, it's help, but have to have a two witness. So for example, in the, the newspaper, sometimes the, in Japan, you can see the you know, wanted. I am such and such person. I was standing 
the next to the such and such a you know bridge the day of August 6. If somebody remembered me, please appear. But of course now it's so difficult to find it. So I hope you know Japan that you know they had to do something about that. But recently the people who got the black rain, they tried to tell the you know, they went to the court to try to you know uh, get some kind of <clears throat> the help from the government, but that they would not uh, pass. But now, uh, the recently, yes, there are <clears throat> the people who were under the, you know, black wing and uh, got on the court. So uh, they will be able to get uh, some help from the government. That's perfect, Koko-san. So thank you so much for that. The next question, um, again, we're going to get through as much as we can, is directed at Sarah, but I think that other panelists can tune in if they want as well. Um, the next question um, comes to us today from the audience. Do you think that atomic art will continue to be produced in Japan? How might it differ from the art created by the war generation? Yes, but I think um, what I really hope to add, and I'm glad this kind of allows me to, to make this note, as um, and especially speaking as an American um, in this conversation, um, I think, you know, and I saw another question that related to this, and I think this can kind of package a few things together here. Um, when I was young and I was in uh, elementary school, there was certainly a us and a them kind of discussed in this conversation. So, you know, they bombed us, we bombed them. And I think... Um, part of the, the moment that we're all living in right now is we're able to kind of break down some of these things and start to think about things in a more um, we scenario because we share everything right now. Um, and I think in terms of um, uh, kind of feeling it, it's, it's normal for people in the United States or other countries to kind of displace or disengage from histories that are um, not part of their timelines or not part of their geographic locations. Um, it's starting to melt away and I'm really excited for that because I think um, with this kind of internet phase we're all in and all of this, um, and especially in the kind of world events right now, people are being much more open to um, working together on these things. And when I think about um, atomic art moving forward and I think about um, how it's being taught in classrooms or could be, um, I think that there's so many new possibilities out there. Um, someone I saw asked about how they could be involved in uh, art making for peace and peacemaking. And, you know, the cranes, these small things everyone does, they, they have meaning for others. And um, I think that as more understand that this is a global issue, as Mimoto-sensei had kind of wrapped up there, this isn't a Japan issue necessarily, this is an everyone issue. So the artwork that will be made and the expressions that will be um, conveyed through it is really um, an, an, open, an open world right now. And I'm, I'm really here for that too. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so our next question, um, I'm trying to kind of trying to consolidate to. Um, we had a question asking for, um, this would be for all the panelists who want to answer. Uh, we had a question asking about the differences between the Nagasaki and Hiroshima peace parks and museums, as well as a question on um, that the both cities have a healthy religious populations. Nagasaki's hypocenter was Urakami Cathedral. Um, yeah, that's a very chilling place. I remember seeing like the headless statues there. Um, so this question asks, how have religious um, denominations reconciled the usage and continued existence of nuclear weapons? So this is for all the panelists, whoever feels comfortable asking this, answering this, sorry. Okay, can I say it? Yes, of course. Hiroshima is uh, the, uh, doing, you know, the wartime. Of course, Hiroshima cities, most of the people are Buddhist. And uh, Akimonto is a special, you know, uh, the uh, sect of the Buddhist. But after the disaster, I'm very, you know, happy to hear this. And uh, <clears throat> I was, you know, uh, attended since I was a little girl that uh, all the religious clergymen got together and the Buddhist monks and the Shinto uh, priests and Catholic for, you know, the priest and Protestant minister, they all got together and in front of the unknown peoples, uh, the mound, 
and they have, uh, you know, the joint service every August, mo you know, 6.15 in the morning. To me, that's it's very important because many people died and in that month, <clears throat> that right after the, the you know, the, 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 the August 6, uh, the few days after that, and about 70,000 ashes were uh, buried up there. But we don't know the, you know, each person's, even the name, or oh, of course, you know, we don't know anything about the religion. So all the you know, clergymen got together, had the joint service. That's, you know, that was for the Hiroshima. But for the Nagasaki, of course, the Catholic population was, you know, much bigger because they're <coughs> that uh, a little different of the, you know, those two uh, cities. Do you understand? Do you understand? I'm trying to you know, tell. But. Yes, thank you, Koko-san, for that perspective. Um, would any of the other panelists, before we get to maybe one final question, would any of the other panelists uh, like to mention anything about Nagasaki and the difference between the parks? Oh, yes. Um, yes, Yuki. Hey, um, well, one question which about um, the Nagasaki. You might want to check out the Nagai Takashi, who is the leader of Catholic community in Nagasaki at the time of the bombing. And he was a convert, but he was a respected, actually, medical doctor who is a radiologist. And he was diagnosed with leukemia even before the bombing. Uh, but he was, um, he was the one who was saying, like, we thank God. We, we thank God for the atom bomb. We are, uh, those people who were killed by the bomb were chosen uh, chosen victims, they are unblemished lambs because they are so um, not, not sinful at all, like us who, who survived. So in his understanding, uh, but this, this speech was made to the congregation. So this is only to address the Catholic community, um, but it's a very distinctive understanding, but it was embraced by people who are suffering from, not just from the physical uh, pains, but also the emotional pains who lost their loved ones because they wanna know, they wanna believe that those loved ones are good ones. Uh, so that's one way to kind of uh, set the course how Nagasaki bomb was remembered, but also the big dif differences between the two, uh, in addition to Koko-san's Koko-san's comment is that Hiroshima bomb was dropped in the center of the city, which is a commercial and residential areas. So most people can share their experiences, although there was some discrimination among themselves, people who suffered from the atomic bombing because people think that, that their disease was contagious or some other rumors, um, but still to some extent they could share their experiences. Whereas in Nagasaki, which is a little off from the center, city center, and the Catholic community, which is large in Japan, but as a community in, in relation to other parts of Nagasaki and other parts of Japan, they are minorities, religious minorities, and they were deliberately put next next to two, the untouchable class in Japan. So what happened to them was sort of, you know, those less regarded population became the victim of the bomb. So Nagasaki as a whole, they have different other histories, like that's the place where, which opened to uh, the Western civilizations in the 19th century, and then they were kind of advanced and they have good histories that they want to boast about. Uh, they don't have to hang on to this, you know, sad story. Whereas Hiroshima, it was more like, you know, everyone was affected. Uh, so that was the differences between how memory was uh, handed down and also uh, Catholic identity was sort of emphasized or highlighted in Nagasaki. Sheila? Yes. Can I add uh, just a contemporary? Of course, person? yes, thanks Tom. Um, so this is just for very recent, uh, or, or um, I would say the difference, uh, a big difference between the two cities is Hiroshima is much more accessible from Tokyo than Nagasaki. There's no Shinkansen to Nagasaki. So I think for most of like kind of the contemporary and popular discourse, Hiroshima is the place that was bombed and was first. So people kind of forget. 
and that kind of has the cities develop a bit differently. So uh, Hiroshima in recent years has been a much more global city under Mayor uh, Kasumi uh, uh, Matsui, where he wants to bring in these big dignitaries to kind of make Hiroshima's experience well known. So that's how President Obama came, uh, Secretary Kerry, among others, whereas uh, Nagasaki doesn't get those big guests because it's a bit further away. Uh, and so um, the Nagasaki city, I would argue, is much more uh, aggressive in making the anti-nuclear argument. Mayor Taoe uh, is much more um, uh, critical of the federal government's uh, nuclear policy, uh, whereas um, for Hiroshima, the Secretary of State was Kishida, who was actually from Hiroshima, and he was working under Abe, who's not very anti-nuclear. So I think the, the contemporary politics has them actually quite different. Oh, very interesting. Thank you, Tom and Yuki, for answering that, and for Koko-san for adding those important perspectives. I mean, I think I believe, I remember when the Nagasaki Museum uh, seeing the priest's rosary uh, that you mentioned, Yuki, and I believe he wrote a um, a manuscript, I think, has been translated into English. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's a very interesting history. And Tom, you're, you're absolutely right. I remember uh, I, was, I was able to get from Toyama to Hiroshima quite easily, but then Matsuyama only had to be, a, or, sorry, Matsuyama to Nagasaki was a little bit easier, but was still quite a long trip. And I remember taking like a night bus, but I think Thank you so much, excuse me. Thank you so much, Tom, to uh, mention about that. Because sometimes the student, American students or foreign students ask me, why the people goes to you know, Hiroshima, uh, London, and Nagasaki? Is there any discrimination or something like that? So I said, no, 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 no. The, the main thing is Shinkansen, bullet train. If bullet train goes to Nagasaki first, of course people go to Nagasaki in the Hiroshima. But you know, the, the uh, bullet train is going to Hiroshima. And in order to go to Nagasaki, you had to go to you had to go to Fukuoka, then transfer the another a local you know train. So much farther. So there is no you know uh, the discrimination or anything, but it's because of the you know the the uh, uh, the transportations wise. So I'm so glad that Tom mentioned about that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Koko-san. Um, so now I'm going to um, turn the mic over to Lara, who will um, lead us into our final questions that I, question of the evening that I believe will be directed to all the panelists. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much, Sheila. And again, thank you again for all the panelists for staying over. And thank you to all the attendees for bearing with us. We had a lot of fantastic information and wanted to make sure to give you all a break in between so your attention spans could be sharper than ever. But the last question was actually originally a question um, inspired by Tom's presentation about engaging the generations. But I thought it would be a great question to combine with a couple other ones that were submitted um, to kind of end on a strong note. Um, with that said, when we end the panel, um, I'll give some closing remarks as well. So how can we engage in activism, no matter where we are, and to encourage everyone, especially the younger generation, to continue leading the peace movement and advocating for human rights? Anyone can chime in. Is that right to say it? Since I'm the youngest, you know, survivors, and everybody, the survivor is getting, you know, really, you know, old. And like this, today, this, you know, jet, this uh, program, the younger people is really work for the you know, future. That's wonderful. And uh, you're the one next generation. So I am depend on each one of you who attend this meeting. And this world is such a you know, beautiful earth. So I would like to, you know, put all my hope and dream to everybody in your hand. And I believe you can make a better world. Thank you so much today. That was so beautiful, thank you. Coco song got me fired up, man. And it's like, you know, 10 o'clock in Chicago. <laughs> like, I'm ready to go. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Coco san Stay on a little bit longer if you can. We plan on getting a photo of the panelists because we forgot to do it ahead of time. But any other panelists would like to address the question of, you know, how can we engage in activism, encourage other folks, especially of different generations, to do so as well, from the peace movement to engaging and advocating for human rights? Yeah, I'd love to um, note that there's another DePaul faculty who told me this really lovely sentiment that 
history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it always rhymes. And I think this is a really important sentiment, um, and especially for, um, it's odd to say younger people, like, do I, do I get to include myself in this anymore? I don't know, I'm in this place in my life. But in any event, um, for younger people or, or our peers, I suppose, um, it's really important. And I think um, people are seeing that more, again, as I mentioned before, but um, talking about these things and um, having more events like this, seeing that there's 50 people still here, uh, two hours in um, is, is really something. And this is, I think, how it's done. And this is how you um, can also be an activist just by participating in the conversations and being a listener and being here for it. Um, but, you know, to that end, um, doing more too, right? So the more is just um, doing, reading more and listening more and getting news sources from a few places and um, taking a little bit more time to um, keep keep yourself informed. And really that's like, a pretty big ask, I know it, but I think um, if you're asking me, education is the truest form of activism and, and everyone can engage in that. And I think you can you can jump in at any age. So um, also the gateway drugs like manga and anime to um, understanding Japan. We've got Barefoot Gen, we've got Gojira. We have a lot of different pop culture references, Spider-Man. We can go across the gamut so people can get their toe in the door to learn more about this topic. That's amazing, Sarah. And especially, um, again, everyone on the call, we are going to follow up with follow up email with anything that was posted in the chat that's relevant to the conversation, as well as panelists or speakers. Please feel free to share links with us. We'll include those as well. Does any of the other speakers want to chime in? If not, I know we've all been talking for about two hours. Yuki. May Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thinking of how you know how stupid I was when I was young, I I have much more faith in the younger generations. They are they are great. They participated in demonstrations and marches. And you, Jet AA, you just um, organized the B, um, uh, BLM, right? Uh, so I think those are actually related. In the 80s, actually before, uh, two years ago, there was a big women's march, right? Um, and that was the biggest. But before that, the biggest demonstration in the United States was anti-nuclear movement, anti-nuclear march in the 80s. And that kind of died down. I guess it's because during that time, uh, the uh, this discourse was, well, there were uh, Soviet Union and they have these many nuclear weapons. We have these many nuclear weapons. If we start something, it's gonna be the end of the world. Um, but right now, the more immediate, uh, our, our situation is actually uh, far worse or dire situation. That's where we are in and um, far worse when it comes to the environment. And the younger generations, you know, they know what the world is like in terms of the environment and also the nuclear um, uranium mines is about the uh, racial justice issues. Uh, so it definitely leads up to other racial issues as well. So this is environmental issues. This is human rights issues. And those things which, you know, younger people are already immersed themselves in, it seems. But I guess it's just that there are not many channels to, you know, get related to. And uh, here I see like young, young faces and um, semi-young face like Koko-san, you know, like that we have resources in other words. You know, Sarah has been working so hard on this, you know, she's the pro activist and activist. And so we can always, I, I'm sure that JAA has more people who are willing to do things and have resources. So um, I, think, I think that's wonderful. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the shout out um, to Jet AA, um, Chicago, uh, Miyamoto Sensei. Tom, want to close this out before I give closing remarks? Yeah, I'll just say something short. Um, so as my students know, I think that the politics is who gets what, when, and why. And that's, so nuclear weapons, uh, how do they continue? It's because they're paid for. So when President Obama went to Hiroshima to talk about nuclear weapons, he also renewed the nuclear budget by trillion dollars over 30 years, right? So if you want to make a direct impact on it, uh, I would say uh, don't vote for people that support nuclear weapons. Uh, donate money to the really poor uh, activist groups out there uh, in Hiroshima, uh, in Japan, that are trying to work on the issue. Uh, local governments are really responsive, such as through Mayors for Peace. So if you could like support local groups, show
life that bring alumni, JET alumni together from across the Midwest, the world, and everywhere in between to talk about necessary things. It was Black Lives Matter last month. It's this um, the Hiroshima Nagasaki legacy this month, and who knows what's next. So feel free to give us some great constructive feedback on where we should go next. I really want to give a big thank you to Sheila who spearheaded all this. This was her brainchild and brought us all together along with my fellow officers who also supported her in this. Again, thank you so much to Jet AA South um, California, Southern California and Arizona for their co-sponsorship. We love you all the way over here two hours in the future. I especially, first and like, or last but not least, do not want to forget to thank, again, our speakers tonight. They have donated their time for y'all. So everyone, wherever you're at in the world, no matter how tired you are, please give a round of applause, snaps, little spirit fingers, and everyone in between for each other, and especially these speakers. Coco, Yuki, Tom, and Sarah, thank you so much for donating your time tonight and educating us, bonding with us, connecting with us, making me cry, um, and everywhere in between. I've learned so much, and it's just been such an honor to be in this virtual space. I feel you all right now in this space, even though it's through a computer, and I can't wait to meet you all in person or on the other side. Um, so with that said, thank you everyone in the audience for sticking with us, especially those to the end. We do not know when it, um, we will be releasing the recording. We have to do some edits and stuff from there, but be sure when we do, you will get a follow-up email. Or again, please follow us on social media or our website activity at Jade Chicago is a good hashtag and handle for us. So with that, we're better when we jet together. I do ask the panelists to, or the speakers to stay on the call. We're gonna do a photo. So those of you in the audience, if you really want to see us do a screenshot, go ahead. Um, but I would like to ask uh, Tyler and Gabe to turn their cameras back on so we can do a photo. And everyone on the call who is att in attendance, thank you so much for coming. Have a great night. Oskare sama deshita and oyasumi nasai, which is cheers to good work and good night. <laughs>